Hello, 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 Santa Barbara. It's your Chantress of everything valuable stop, and stop, beautiful. Stop, 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 okay. stop, Three, two, one. You're live. Hello, 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 Santa Barbara. It's your Chantress of everything valuable and beautiful, Elizabeth Stewart. And you know, we've got some amazing people that come and do Zoom lectures. And uh, so that's the silver lining to the to the great plague we've been going through. And uh, by the way, we've got a fantastic lecture coming up at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. I think it's August the 5th, is it not, Bart? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, August <laughs> the correct. 5th. Bart J.C. DeVolder, who is the chief conservator at Princeton University Museum of Art is gonna talk about uh, two things, Arrest the restoration of the Ghent altarpiece but then, you know, his conservation and his treatment of the altarpiece and then a magnificent revelation. And we're going to talk a little bit about what Bart found, et cetera. But before we do, uh, I want to just tell you, dear listener, the, that, that to conserve artwork is a very rare um, job and it's a very demanding job. We don't really have the kind of education in this country that they do in Europe for such things. Um, and Bart is a product of the European tradition, the European schools um, of conservation and restoration. And, you know, to be a good restorer, you've got to have a combination of a little bit of chemi chemistry background, a little bit of physics background, a little bit of art background, a lot of art history background. And then you've got to understand how things sit upon each other. So if you Consider, you know, the, a painting has a canvas or board or something on, that's the support. And then there's a, uh, usually a treatment on top of that. And then there's the, the oil paint on top of that. And then there's the varnishing and the glazing, et cetera. So there's so many different layers. And a good conservator or restorer has to understand each layer. And I'll, I'll start the hour by telling Bart, a horror story. You know, I'm an appraiser. I've been appraising fine art for 30 years. And um, client had a very wealthy grandmother who lived in Paris, was a good friend of Marc Chagall's. And Marc did a pencil drawing of his grandmother. Oh, and the kicker to this story was this uh, was a very high powered attorney in town. And so, you know, a prosecuting attorney, by the way. So he owned this Chagall of his grandmother, quite large drawing in graphite. And then it was signed and dedicated to his grandmother. And I don't know, they may have had an affair or something. It was a very loving <laughs> signature and inscription in French and this sort of thing. And so he came to my office. I said, well, you know, I, I think it's fantastic. And I, I, I really don't, I really can't get you a value because it's, you know, dear listener, he had had it in a frame and the back of the painting he had cardboard and back of the drawing was cardboard so over the years this acid in the cardboard had eaten through to where you got all this we call it foxing these bl brown blotches all over and the fading and so we could hardly see the image anymore so I said you know this was years ago Bart I said look let's take it to the Getty Conservation Lab Let's see if they can do something to the paper. We can actually see your grandmother if we do something to the paper. Do you know what they did, Bart? They probably sun bleached it, no? They bleached it. Yeah. They chemically bleached it, but they didn't test, they tested the drawing graphite, but they didn't test the graphite of the signature, which apparently was done later. Ah. <laughs> And when the client got it back, remember prosecuting attorney, when he got it back, there was no inscription and no signature. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch, yeah. And I was the one that recommended the certain conservator at the Getty. So I was running scared for a while. But that's what I'm saying, dear listener, is that the job that Bart does is so full of so many different ways to figure out a problem. And, the, you know, I was talking with... Um, a conservator just this morning trying to get a sense of the questions to ask Bart. What is a conservator actually? Is a conservator a scientist, a forensic investigator, an artist, a reinterpreter of history? You know, what is a conservator? So I thought we'd talk a little bit about, first of all, the job of conservation, and then 
I want us to talk about the um, revelation that you'll be lecturing about too, Bart, but if you could say maybe three sentences about conservation to people that don't really understand sure. what it is. Yeah, I, I'll have to correct you one, otherwise I get so many phone, angry phone calls tomorrow. There are three very good programs in the, in the, in America for conservation. Oh, really? Okay, so yeah. you, you're dating me. When I was interested in it, there was really yeah, nothing. No, there, yeah, there is one in, uh, that's affiliated with NYU, one in, uh, in Delaware, and one affiliated in, um, in Buffalo. So yeah, those are very good programs, but three is very limited, right? It's a big country. So there are many people like me who got trained in the European uh, training system and then come here. Um, so yeah, that's one thing. But yeah, I think your question is a very good one about what are we? Are we scientists? Are we artists? Are we uh, yeah, investigators? And, and I think a good conservator is a little bit of all of those, right? And, and I think depending on who you ask, the answer will be, quite similar, but the emphasis on which of those many hats that we wear will be different with each, pers each person. And that's why it's such a fantastic job. I think everybody conservator can find a way. Um, I personally come from the very much artistic side because I did art high school. I did, you know, a, um, academy, a drawing academy since I was six, all the way up till I was 18 every Saturday morning. So I'm very much, um, and my strength is definitely the more hands-on and our job also has changed a lot the, the last you know, 20, 30, 40, even 50 years. And absolutely, as you said, pushed more into the scientific. Um, and and you know, we can only be that much, right? So out of that need of more science-based science um, methods and understanding grew this whole new hybrid person, which we call a conservation scientist. So that's kind of almost now a subgenre in, in what we do, but um, all of us, we have some, as you nicely said, some knowledge of chemistry and physics. But when you're really, really delving deep into the science, uh, the deep the molecular structure of art, there luckily now in our field, we have conservation scientists. And, and the Getty, for example, has, has many and many good ones. And um, you know, most bigger museums in America do have these scientists. And that really came out of the needs of our profession going a little bit away from this romantic idea of, you know, being an artist or some might say a frustrated artist to this very high tech science job it is yeah. now. And I feel comfortable kind of right in the middle, I would say. So, okay, so there's a couple of words. I want you to just speak a little bit about this controversy that I've always wondered about. And I don't know what the policy is at Princeton, but, um, so for a while, um, you know, I, I was docent at the Getty for a while and did some tours and this sort of thing. And it seemed to me that the Getty outside of other museums restored things to period. In other words, they looked like they had just come right off the artist mm -hmm. easel. And then other museums that I had actually visited or studied, I, I did a um, honors year at uh, Victoria and Albert, for example, the, you know, their, their canvases are not like that. They they tend, so, you know, where do you stand on that? It, it, so what I'm saying, dear listener, mm -hmm. I want, I want Bart to, uh, to answer a question. So when you go into museum, dear listener, are you going into museum to see the accumulation of history upon the work? So it looks like it's 17th century, et cetera. Or are you expecting, for example, to have that piece look like it came fresh off the artist canvas from 1730 into your eyes right now. So what, what's your what's your stance, Bart? Yeah, that, that's a team and uh, that's something I've been actually very interested in the past three years since I came to Princeton and hoping to develop it actually in a full class. So please interrupt me if I go on too long. <laughs> but um, for, for the listeners who are interested in that topic, that is exactly what the whole Ghent Alderpiece talk will be about. Like, who are we as a conservator in deciding where are we taking a piece? Are we, you know, staying with the current situation? Are we going back to the last treatment that we know of? Or as you said, are we going back as close as we think to the, um, the artist's intention? And, and, and any of these decisions can be defended, right? And what is important in your comparison between Victoria and Albert and the Getty is that they're very different museums. Um, so the Getty is very much a, a, a collection of masterpieces where every piece is, you know, really amazing and mostly from 
the height of the artist's uh, capabilities, where the Victorian Art Museum is a much more dense museum that has yeah. many, many of each, a great, a good, a mediocre one. And, and there is strength in that too. And it's just impossible for museums like Victoria and Albert to, to go far with all their paintings. In addition though, I mean, you're also right saying that every museum also has their own conservation department. And there are also tendencies, right? In the eighties, when there were, you know, just after these big cleaning controversies that happened, started in England and then kind of moved to here, the National Gallery, for example, here. Yeah. You know, those, those, those can happen. And, and a lot of them as what I've seen in, in my career, I mean, I've graduated in 2002, so I've been around a little bit, is that it really depends also how you inform the audience. And, and that as well is going to be something I'm going to talk about in my lecture is that the Ghent Alderpiece restoration was done in what we might call like a fishbowl. So the entire treatment was open to the public. So everybody could come Monday to Friday and Saturday, Sunday, we weren't working, but you could still see the work. And I think it helps for people to see that change happening over time. But, but that's already an interpretation because your question is even more die hard, if I might say, like, do we keep the current state or do we start removing? And, you know, I, I think it, it is a little, it's nice to, if, we are, if it's safe to do so, to remove some of the later editions if we document them well. I mean, I like to compare it often with archaeological um, investigations, right? Mm. An archaeologist is going to scrape away a layer and going to document that layer before it's all tossed. And also with archaeological digs, how deep do you go, right? Do right. you go to that 12th century layer or are you happy with your 15th century? And, and that in our profession, it's, it's very hard. And every case is very different. And without spoiling the lecture i mean in the ghent altarpiece we decided to go back as far as we could so yeah. when we get back from the break i want you yeah. to give us a little background i mean it, it just dear listener the ghent altarpiece is 1432 uh by two brothers uh, jan and hubert van eiken it's one of the most iconic works of western art um and for a lot of different reasons but you know a lot of our historians say that it's iconic because it's birthing a new way of looking uh, totally new way of interpreting and looking. So, um, you know, the other thing that about the altarpiece is that I don't know how many books have been written about all the thefts involved around the altarpiece. And so it has a double whammy first in its visionary outlook and interior dialogue, but it's also a first in the history of art theft. Uh, and so, you know, the ideas that Brett is talking about his conservation treatment in a fishbowl, uh, the, the painting is in the St. Babo Cathedral in Ghent in Belgium. Uh, it was created for that site. Um, and the, the full title, by the way, is the Ghent Altarpiece or Mystic Lamb. And, um, you know, I, I'm interested to know because I couldn't find anywhere in my research when it was first started to be restored. You know, we're talking about a 15th century piece. So when was it, who started it first? Was there somebody in the 16th century? You know, I wanted to ask Brett about that when we get back, but there's also, you know, the idea of where the real lays. So if you've got how many layers of overpaint and treatment, where do we find the real artists? I mean, and that's what I want to, to talk to with Brett. And I imagine that's, if you don't want to spoil the lecture, maybe talk a little around it, but that's what I'd like to hear. And Richard, uh, let's go to a quick break, reintroduce. I have the great pleasure, thanks to the Museum of San, uh, Santa Barbara Museum of Art, they arranged for me to speak with Bar J.C. DeVolder. I had a great time last night. I looked at eight pages of his background and all the things he's done <laughs> in his past. And, you know, it's just been a real interesting insight into Bart's career and education as a conservator of some of the world's greatest art. And in fact, again, altarpiece is right up there, top three. So we got to talk about that. We get back from the break. Don't turn that down. Back with Bart DeVolder in one minute. All right, Richard. I have a weird question. I, I mean, I have it on my, my, cl my clipboard here, Brett, but um, 
I'm not going to ask it on the air, but it seemed really interesting to me that some of your early work, you know, that you've um, published on representation of gold brocades in Niederlandish paintings. Uh -huh. And I thought, oh, I wonder if that helped him with the Ghent. You know, oh, absolutely. That, yeah, I that can I only imagine. That? Oh, it's okay, Richie. We're talking shop. It's a. Uh, oh, I know. I know. I'm just letting you know. I'm ready to go. Okay, let's go. <laughs> All right. Three, two, one. You're live. Welcome back. I'm talking with Bart J.C. DeVolder. He is the chief conservator at the Princeton University Museum of Art. And our museum here in Santa Barbara was lucky enough to score a Zoom lecture talk about um, a project that he was I think spearheading? Uh, are you were you spearheading or were you involved? You were I was the yeah I was the kind of the the coordinator. I was like I like to call myself I was the oil of the machine. It was yes. a big team of more than eight people, but yeah. So he ra he ran the machine of eight people <laughs> over a number of years to restore the Ghent altarpiece or the Mystic Lamb, and uh, this is talking about a altarpiece dating from 1432, um, in which you know, the, I don't know, the press uh, amongst other outlets said, oh, well, you know, the real artist, the real Van Eck is hidden beneath the overpaint. Um, and I wanted to know how valid that claim is, Bart. Yeah, that's, um, that will be exactly the topic. It, it really is a revelation what we found. And I think, as you also said in the first segments, how many books have been written about the Ghent altarpiece? Uh, it's probably half a library full. And I hate to say it, but all of those books need to go in the trash can. And, you know, it's really fantastic. Why? Why? Because we've been looking at this very iconic image and not knowing that in certain parts, 70 to... 75% were completely repainted by a later painter slash restorer. Um, and, and that as early as in less than a century after it was completed. Ah, so, so that's the answer to my question. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, so, so within a, a century, order. okay. So by, by, by 1550, it had been overpainted. Yep, and probably a little bit earlier already. And, and, and that's, yeah, and, and that is what is so amazing. And that is also the reason why it took so many centuries or at least so many years in our case, because we were literally sitting on top of these paintings with the biggest and the most expensive microscopes and, and, and goggles. And after a year and a half, only then we figured it out. So even for us as, as a team of eight highly specialized trained people, not only conservators, but conservators specializing in paintings on panel by the 15th century artists that it took us a year and a half to figure it out. It was, it's truly humbling in a way that the art always wins, right? I mean, we can, you know, it just makes, it makes fools out of you as a famous conservator once said, and it's true. But all the science and all the machines we had on that painting since 2010, like two years before we started touching it, it was such an, a big surprise that nobody of us had ever, I mean, we could have imagined it. And, and, and if I may, the reasons, I think there's, it's threefold. One is that it had so many dirty varnished layers on it. So in the past, sometimes a painting was restored, they would just put a new varnish on. But all these varnishes yellow over time, and therefore every so many years, maybe every half a century, which is a lot of varnishes, right? If you start from 1426, so it would get yellower and yellow and more yellow. In addition to that, as I said, the overpaint was done by very famous artists themselves using the same kind of paint. And therefore another kind of um, smoking gun thing that restorers use to differentiate non-original paint on top of original paint is these little cracks in the paint surface, what we call crackalure. And, you know, because this paint was almost as old as the original, it cracked the same way. <laughs> So that we couldn't help. And I think the one that people forget to mention, but I, as a Belgian, um, think is very important. We were learned from very young in school that this is the most important painting in our country. And who are we to second guess what everybody, as you said, all these books say, this is the most important painting of the 15th century, Northern painting at least, how that was not true because we've been looking at overpaint done by two probably two famous painters, but not Jan or Hubert van Eyck. So it's completely crazy. 
And so uh, I have a, I have another question for sure. you. So you know, um, I don't know how you feel about this, but Thomas Hoving's book. Um, yes. By the way, dear listener, Thomas Hoving is director of the of the Met, and he talks about the aha moment, many aha moments that he's had, where he's called in. He was talking about a certain. Um, a certain pre-classic sculpture in this book, et cetera, et cetera. So he, he walks in, there's a circle of conservators, restorers, scientists, and he, by his very eye, can say the fingernails are wrong and it's not what you all think it is. And it has never been. And, um, and he's a great proponent of the connoisseur for that reason. Well, okay. So now Bart is telling me that for, well, since 14... 32, 36, no one has ever suggested, uh, in, and as a matter of fact, we talk about the 18th and 19th century, the literature written about the, the altarpiece, no one has ever by their eye suggested, wow, there's something not quite right. Is that correct? Yeah, the people that have questioned it would go maybe as far as saying, you know, it's not the Van Egg that we know, like it's highly detailed and highly meticulous brush strokes because it was painted to be seen in a church from afar. Or the other Van Eggs that we have, I mean, we don't have that many, are mostly really small. So they said, well, he had a specific style for painting the small paintings, and he had another style for painting the large ones. Or another one that they kind of throw out there as well, he probably had five or six assistants. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. You know, and the clothing, therefore, is a little bit maybe not as refined, but the faces are all beautiful. But now what we found is we can, we can say why. It's not because it's an assistant. It's not because it was um, painted to be seen from far away. It was because the restorer that worked on it, restorers, were scared to touch all these highly refined parts like the face and kind of went around it. So all these overpaints that I'm um, mentioning were mostly, especially on that, when the, the painting is closed, which is hard for the listeners to envision, but I encourage everybody to maybe go check out the website closer to Van Eyck, which is amazing. Um, it's really focusing on these, on the clothing, on the backgrounds, and mostly the faces were kind of saved from all these later campaigns. So mm -hmm. I think some art historians maybe felt something was wrong, but as I said, the interpretation was not correct because nobody dared to go out there saying the Ghent Alder piece is 70% overpainted. Okay, so let me just summarize that. So, listen, what, what Bart, I think, is, is saying is that, you know, we were talking about there's, there's this kind of two camps or previous to, to Bart's, you know, um, I would say generation, I guess more my generation, there was two camps, you know, there's the connoisseurship camp, which is it, no, no one, no one scientist, conservative, restore, conservation scientist could possibly match a developed, what they call in the art world, a developed eye. Nobody could possibly, no amount of forensic could possibly match. And, you know, there were great proponents of this. I mentioned Thomas Hoving, this other heads of museums, et cetera, that, you know, by virtue of their hubris and uh, stance in the art world had this idea that the, uh, oh, Berenson's another one, but the idea that, you know, that, that, that I will triumph all kinds of forensic investigation. And my question to Bart was, okay, if, if, if you've got all those centuries from the 15th century on of people that are scholars looking at the painting, the faces look different from the clothing. So what's the reason for that? And what Bart, I think, is telling me is reasons were pulled out of the air to substantiate the difference. So, oh, it was because they were seen from a distance. It was because of this. It was because... There was one style for up close, one style for far, one style for small, one style for big, et cetera. So it was all these, you know, um, what do you want to call it? Um, not, it's worse than reasons. What's the word for it? <laughs> you know, defenses. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I why. Think, yeah. It, it kind of to make the story fit, right? It, it's kind of mm. really grabbing things out of. But, but just to be clear though, I'm a very big fan of connoisseurship. And, and I mean, we, the team actually, the restoration team gave a lecture on the most important scientific tool that we have, and it's our eye. Yeah. Um, because we would have not found it with all the big science parts. We really, it was the eye that, our eyes that made the link 
And thanks to that observation, then we brought in the big guns and the big science and, and we proved that what we thought we saw was true. So a good combination. And, and that's why almost every good conservation team now exists out of conservators, art historians and conservation scientists. And it's that group work that, that makes it so powerful. And, and that just didn't happen back in the day. As in, okay, so so just real fast, Richard's giving us a one minute time before break, okay. but just real fast. So you've got a group work, and in my day, those the people in the in those three camps that you mentioned would have actually had disagreements. Absolutely, and that is something that's you know in 1951, which is the last time a big restoration happened on the altar piece. That's the first time this actually happened. This international committee of a nice group of scientists conservators and art historians and since that time since the 50s it's only gotten better and better and now in you know 21st century nobody's undertaking a very important treatment without having all those partners present luckily <laughs> so so when we get back from the break i want you to talk bart if you can um the last five minutes i have with you i want you to talk a little bit about the moment that i so the I, not the I as in I, capital oh, yeah. I, but E-Y-E. -E. So there's this term, the, the I, you know, when the collective I of 16 I's divided by eight specialists, when those 16 I's realized what they were looking at, what was that moment like? Was it all happening to all 16 I's at once? Was it happening to one set of I's and then catching on like uh, COVID-19, for example. <laughs> Ugh, what an analogy. So when we get back from the yep. break, we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, Richard, let's go to quick break. We're introducing Bart J.C. DeVolder. He is the chief conservator, Princeton University Art Museum, and we are actually happy to have him lectured to us on August the 5th, Santa Barbara Museum of Art Zoom lecture. Do not miss it. We'll be back in a minute. All right, you're clear, stand by. Welcome back. I'm I can just hear Thomas holding, you know, it's like. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's truly, I mean, those people, they did have something special though. Oh, and, sure. Uh, it's, uh, but it's, he knew it. Yeah, they um, those kind of. I mean, luckily there's there's still people around um, like that. But it's it's good that everybody knows their limitations and that if we work together, we can be much more certain about things. And you know, it's um, it's it, you I, know one day somebody's gonna land upon you and say this would make a movie. Just the conflicts and all the the historical conflicts oh, between. Yeah, as I've been told many times, I should write a book about. This, um, you should, kind of, yeah. The six years that I was there, and you know, maybe I, I will, <laughs> because it, it was it was very, you know, it's it, it does something to you, right? I mean, without getting too romantic about it, but putting eight people in a glass box for six years, it's you know, that's a long time. So, um, hey, Richard, are we are we live yet? No, okay, so. <laughs> So that that's interesting, and I, yeah. So so talk to us a little bit about sure. Bart, that that moment that the eyes all saw what they saw, and then I want to ask one more question, and then um, we'll 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 let all right, you I'm go. Ready. Okay. Three, two, one. You're live. Welcome back into Elizabeth Stewart. Have the great honor and pleasure of speaking with Bart J. C. DeVolder, Chief Conservator, Princeton University Museum of Art. And he's coming August the 5th. Um, I sent out an email blast to all my friends interested in uh, anything having to do with art conservation this morning. Um, and my question to Bart was, you know, he was in a glass enclosed space in front of the Ghent altarpiece for six years with eight experts. There were 16 eyes looking for eight years, I think it was eight. Was it eight or six? Uh, eight, yeah. Eight. Okay, and and they're looking, and so I want to know the moment. What happened? Yeah, it was funny when you brought it up again. I got goosebumps. I kind of wanted <laughs> to show them to the camera. It, it, it was it was not 
just like one moment. It was really, it grew. It was somebody saw something, then somebody joined in, just get out of the way, let me look through the microscope. And, and then, you know, when all of us kind of saw it and we, we were kind of scared to say it out loud because we, we, we kind of felt it while we were working that what we were uncovering by removing the varnish layers, it still wasn't very exciting to look at, which sounds so arrogant, right? This is one of the most beautiful paintings in the world. And we were just not feeling it. And it's easy to say afterwards. So when we start looking and we say, no, it's just not possible. It's just not possible that this is really, truly 70% completely covered, as in covered, not as in semi-transparent or a glaze, but opaquely overpainted. And then what we did, we took a little bit of a sample, we made a very small test window, and then we started seeing it with our own eyes that underneath was this beautiful, quite intact paint layer with the typical Van Eyck characteristics, like his real bravura of how paint is applied. You know, and it, it goes to just, sometimes it's just little spots of paint, and sometimes it was gigantic pieces missing. And to give one example, which I will show in the lecture, we, we saw this overpaint, kind of speckled overpaint and said, that's kind of weird, what is it? So we started removing it carefully. And then we stepped backwards and we saw that what was painted out was actually the black veinage in marble. So it was misunderstood by the previous restorers thinking it was just black splotches of paint and had covered it up with white to make the statue appear like a, you know, highly, mm. um, you know, white, you know, whatever material, but definitely not veined marble. And after the overpaint was removed and you step back, all of a sudden the stone came back to life and you see the veinage in the marble. And it's little things like that that really truly make my job, you know, the best in the world. It's just <laughs> yeah. fantastic to be there and be part of this, the history of this painting, right? I mean, you're, it, it, it is, yeah. I mean, that moment was amazing. And, um, yeah. That's yeah. just yeah. remarkable. I'll never forget that. That's that's remarkable. So one final question. You know, um, was there any time? Okay, so this is. I know it's it's going to sound. It's going to sound <laughs> kind of airy fairy, new agey, yucky. Um, but was there a moment when the painting talked to you? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think conservators get so into a painting. I mean, imagine, right? We worked on just one panel out of the whole complex for more than three years on one painting. So I think people, I mean, talking maybe goes far, but you definitely feel one with the painting. And I can tell you, it goes that far. And you know, when you have to take a weekend vacation, it's when you take your bike or you walk home and you start seeing cracks in the pavements of the streets, like that's how close you get to it. That's like, oh no, there is another crack. And does the crack run all the way through or is there something else underneath it? So maybe not talking straight to the painting, but definitely to the materials of the painting. And, and that is what's so beautiful in our job is that we get to really touch and understand how a painting is made. Well, I, I just remember, you know, I, I, I've been looking at, at at clients art for about, at, you know, and furniture. I'm a generalist, so about 30 years. And I can remember, you know, after finishing a, a doctorate in art history, et cetera, et cetera, I had the, 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 the knowledge was clouding my eyes. And so I'd approach a work and I'd hear only what uh, the chatter in my mind and I wouldn't see the work at all, really. Yeah. And then one day some work jumped up and said something to me. And I reversed that. So instead of putting the analysis first, I put the eye first and the analysis second. Whereas before, for 21 years, that was reversed huh. in my career. So that's why I asked you that question. Was there a moment at which the painting actually stood up and said, hey, Bart, or whatever that a painting would say, but, but the idea that it had sunk into your subconscious to where you were seeing the crackler in the concrete in yeah. sidewalk i get it yeah i get it so just another quick shout out um, can't wait for the lecture is uh take a look at the website uh, our santa barbara museum of art website you'll see the lecture advertised and this is august 5th bart jc de Volder is going to talk to us about the ghent altarpiece it's a 15th century icon 
world icon that Brett worked on uh, for with eight other experts. He was the uh, spearhead, I should say. Um, and they, he was in a, what they call a fishbowl, a glass <laughs> enclosed area where he was restoring the altarpiece where it sits in the Bavo Cathedral in Ghent. Um, and he'll talk to us about the moment that it was discovered that for since <laughs> since 1430s, oh no, since I would say 1530, no one had really seen the painting. Yep. <laughs> until that moment. I'm excited to share those experiences and, and it's definitely something you have to see. So the images hopefully will speak for themselves, but I will be talking a little bit too. <laughs> All right, thank you, Bart. And Richard, we're gonna go to quick break and then we're gonna do something totally different. We're gonna talk to two women scholars who have spent uh, near a lifetime researching women in surfing. And the book that they've come out with and some of the films they've come out with um, both dedicated surfers. Um, and so when we come back, we're going to talk about that because Santa Barbara Maritime Museum is having a special book presentation uh, with surfers Vicki Durant and Heather Hudson on July 29th. Um, and a special reception uh, in, in this case for Vicki, who just flew in just about an hour ago from Hawaii. And um, Heather who is local, but she is uh, also a, a, a magnificent historian and quite a good athlete. So both of them are here. I see them come up on the screen. We're gonna talk with them. Something completely different. We're moving from the 15th century. <laughs> completely different, but maybe some artistry there too. So don't turn that down back in a minute. Bart, thank you. Oh, Bart. That was so fun. Oh, oh, so more fun for yeah. me, more yeah. fun for me than for you, for sure. <laughs> And I did, I spoke to two local conservators. I went to their offices today and said, you uh -huh. guys take a look at this. And so you're gonna have some local conservators that um, they're bringing their teams to the lecture as well. Oh, good. So I really I said, wish okay. I was in Santa Barbara next week, but it will be for next time. Yeah, we have a new conservation lab that just opened up here too. So it's, you know, it's growing. Um, also, they're also European educated. So it's, you know, it's, I think I might be back soon. We're uh, the Princeton University is lending a, a Van Gogh painting to Santa Barbara, so I'll, I might bring that painting. So we'll see. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Well, let the museum know to let me know too when you come, right. and we'll do it. We'll talk about that. All right. Thank sure. you, my dear. Bye. Bye. <laughs> right, have fun. <laughs> oh, there she goes. Okay, I'm ready anytime you are, Elizabeth. No, it looks like they're somewhere else. Okay. All right, in three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back, it's Elizabeth Stewart and we're talking with Santa Barbara Maritime Museum folks that are doing a special book talk and presentation. Surfers, Vicki Durant and Heather Hudson. You know, um, if you haven't been to the museum and seen the, the, the show up right now, uh, on surf, surfing and surfing icons. I had the great good fortune to talk with, with two of the, um, I should say, seasoned gentlemen who are part and parcel of the history, very early history of surfing. But they, of course they're men. And so when the museum sent out this uh, email that, that female service, because one of the questions I asked was, you know, if it's a 60 pound surfboard and you're, you know, I, I weigh under a hundred pounds, it would be hard for me to carry a 60 pound surfboard. So what did you guys do about it in 1960? How did you help us, you know, that like to surf at that time? So I, you know, that was one of the questions. So when Greg Gorga said, you know, if you're interested in that, Elizabeth, you should be interested in Vicki Durant, especially. And I want to introduce Vicki. So she just flew in from Hawaii, as I said, in 1957, she won the Mahaka International Surfing Championship, was a contest that included women, included women. Uh, she and her mother were invited to Peru as Hawaiian surfing ambassadors. And, you know, this is also an interesting time to talk about this because I don't know if you guys, if listeners um, 
dear listeners, if you've been listening to the the news about the Olympics, you know, the Hawaiian surf team wants their own flag. You know, they, it's such a cultural thing. Um, so that's a, just a really cool time to talk to Vicky. Um, Vicky actually had, had led kind of a double life. She's an artist and a practicing um, applied artist. You know, she was in fashion design, et cetera. She has a sportswear and textile company. Um, and then she also was a teacher uh, and surfed, you know, um, like I said, in the early, early to mid 1950s. And that just is unheard of. Um, and Heather Hudson became interested in one of the questions I want to ask Heather is how, how she met Vicki, but she became interested. She's a film producer here in Santa Barbara. And some of the music that Richard's going to play for you as we go to break on and off uh, comes from two movies that Heather produced. Women in the Waves is the first one in 2007, I believe that came up, 2016, the follow-up documentary, The Women in the Waves 2. And I believe both were screened at our Santa Barbara Maritime Museum in the past, because I remember hearing about them. Um, let's start off with um, Heather at meeting Vicki. Uh, what was the circumstance? Hi there, thank you so much for having us. Oh yeah. 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 Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> Heather Hudson and, and Vicki Durant. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so uh, I made a film. My, my third film is called 93, Letters from Marge is the subtitle. And uh, I was researching surf pioneer Marge Calhoun, who was the Makaha International Champion in 1958. And she and I had exchanged letters. We were pen pals for eight years. She was included in my first film, The Women and the Waves, that came out in 2009. And oh, yes, 2009, I mistook yeah, that, okay. okay. Yeah, we did screen both those films at the Maritime, so you're correct in that. But in my research, I connected with a lot of friends of Marge Calhoun, and uh, Vicki Durand is one of them. And she shared her letters with me, as well as uh, some other friends. They shared their letters so I could get more detail to my letters that were from Marge. So it was really nice. So we struck up a friendship right. and now we're at an event here in uh, San uh, Oceanside, California Surf Museum. So this worked out great. We're doing an event tonight. Yeah. Right. So you're at Oceanside. You know, what's so interesting is, is talking with some of the, um, the artists and the surf, mm, surf shapers, surfboard shapers that um, are exhibited right now at the Maritime Museum. They, they give great credit to... Um, women entering surfing and they cited the popularity of the movie Gidget. And I, I kind of got a weird taste in my mouth when I heard that. I thought, really? <laughs> well, Vicki's Vicky, the real deal. She was the 57, 57. Makaha oh, International. And I can let her tell you about that. She won the year before Marge Calhoun did. Marge came and beat me and we became lifelong friends. She was my, one of my very, she was almost like my second mother and my very best girlfriend for many years until the, till the end of her life. And I received, I'm proud to say, I received many of these beautiful letters from March. Yeah. So we want to talk a little bit when we get back from the break, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of, um, you know, I, I, I want to put this delicately to Vicki, but were you ever marginalized because you were a woman in the sport? You know, or did you feel, and when we get back from the break, I want to talk a little bit about that. And then, you know, you won the title in 1957. Yeah. Uh, you know, what? how many other women were serving at the time is another thing. Maybe Heather can answer that because of her research, but Let's go to quick break. When we get back from the break, just to reintroduce, I'm talking about a special lecture, book talk and presentation about the female presence in surfing uh, by a history making woman, uh, Vicki Durant, who was a surf award winner in the 1950s in Hawaii. And I'm speaking with the chronicleer, filmmaker and documentarist and historian, Heather Hudson about her research in women in the sport um, 
it, and I always say it's sport, it's wrong, it's art form, women in the art form. So don't turn that down back in a minute. All right, Richard. All right. So, so how, right. how are we doing for time? We've got like 15 or so, or are you, will you edit this? About five. Huh? About 20. You only have about five minutes left. We're competing. We're All right, ready. Richard. So you lived it. I just researched it. And I'm, I live it since the 70s. Back in a minute. No, that was an interesting question. It was like, okay, so if your average surfboard was 60 to 100 pounds, how does a small, I mean, I suppose I could do it, but I couldn't hike that long way with it on my, you know, I mean. Okay, I'm all set. You have four minutes. You have four minutes, Elizabeth. Three, two, one, you're live. Welcome back. It's Elizabeth Stewart. I'm speaking with Heather Hudson and Vicki Durant. Vicki is a uh, historic award winner in surfing uh, as a female. Um, and like I say, Heather Chronicleer, a documentarist, historian of women in surfing, uh, presenting a book talk in uh, at the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum, July 29th from 4 to 5 p.m. Um, Vicki, very quickly, uh, did you ever feel marginalized? No, Elizabeth, I, I didn't. I was just uh, here talking to Heather about that. I don't know. There, it was a time when only maybe we served at the end of what people called the golden era in Waikiki and Makaha. And there were only about a thousand to 2000 people that were surfing. So there were waves for everybody. You know, they're, they just the spots were not crowded and everybody was very friendly and there were very few women out, but I always felt very welcomed and, and friendly. And I'm not, sh I'm not one to really be intimidated anyway, <laughs> not in my personality. <laughs> so, so it's, it was never like what I hear women today. You know, but but to, it's like that today. I, I'm not giving excuses, but I think it's just because there's uh, so many people and not enough waves. So it's dog eat dog and you've got to be really aggressive. It's like getting a parking space, you know, when I see. two or three other people are after the same one. Now, I, I'm interested to know when I was researching your bio, it, it, it said that you and your mother were kind of a team. Did your mom serve? Yes, my mother took, was a very strong, coordinated, and um, competitive athlete. And she started surfing at age 41 on a Hawaiian vacation. And she, after the first wave, she fell in love with it and said, this is my new sport. And as she said, she was bitten by the surfing bug. Well, on the first wave, I fell off and hit my groin on the surfboard and I didn't, it didn't feel good. And I thought, I don't know about this, but she talked me into it. I went back out and then we spent six or seven years surfing together. And uh, she bought this beautiful beach lot out of Makaha Beach in the mid fifties when, and we, camped on it and surfed and made bonfires and we were with you know all the men surfers too it was just a great sport and uh, and and also it's a sport and an art form I think I think it's both and our boards were about 40 pounds but I just uh my last board was a Rennie Yater and he has I think some boards there yeah he does uh, I have that board now. And this friend of mine said, let's get your board out and at least take it to the swimming pool. Well, I could barely carry it, but it's been, it's been 50 plus years also. So then. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Nobody's getting any younger. <laughs> Heather, uh, so Heather, t tell us a little bit about um, you know, the, the just very quickly, we don't have much time, but the, the impact uh, that your films have had on women in surfing. Well, thank you for asking. Um, 
You know, I was just a, I started in the late 70s. So I grew up in Malibu and I had a completely different experience than Vicky because by the 70s, that's when it was very well dominated, dog eat dog. And as a woman, you, I always say this, you really had to want to be out there. And I thought, I remember telling my mom one day after getting home, we lived in the canyon and I said, mom, no one is stopping me from doing this. I was about <laughs> 16 and she's like, okay. So <laughs> 44 years later, yeah, just still loving it, doing it. Anyway, I decided to document it. I started the first film in about 07. So you were pretty close. And I just wanted to um, sort of express what it's been like for women through the decades. So I used everyday people as well as a few champions. And I felt like each woman from a, at that time in the film, 17 years old to uh, 64 was the oldest, Linda Benson, who was a champion and right. Ricky has known her as right. well. Um, but I just wanted to show what it was like as everyday women and in a male dominated sport. Now it's upside down. There are so many women out. And I just think it's really important as Vicki does to talk about the history because the book that she's going to present next Wednesday is it's about her mom and her life and you know just back then you know to you just really had to want to be there and persist so I think both of yeah we both have the same drive to share history uh, just a one quick shout out for if to Lee's interested in this lecture Santa Barbara Maritime Museum take a look at the website a book talk and presentation with Vicki Duran and Heather Hudson both surfers a uh, little bit different generations a <clears throat> little bit different backgrounds um, like say Vicki just flew in from Hawaii for this uh, uh, tour they're in Oceanside they're going to tour two other museums uh, our museum is going to host them July 29th from 4 to 5 p.m. It's a do not miss if you are a female, if you are interested in the art form and the sport. They and are I, both in the same. May I interject? I think the men enjoy it as well. Right. I, I, so many men. Right. No, men come up to us and say, right. thank you so much for doing what you did. Because they have mothers, they have daughters, they have, you know, and, sisters. And yeah. men surprisingly love my book, Wave Woman, The Life and Struggles of a Surfing Pioneer. Men love it too. And her book, I am reading it as in the months, just this summer. And she gives a lot of great history alongside her mother experiencing things. So it's a must read. Anyone Thank you both. Her, Thank you, Vicki Vicky Durant and Heather Hudson. And we will look forward to your talk we July 20th you. when you come Thank into you. town. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Bye. 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 Okay. so. So I'm going to send um, the museum, 